I hope all of you have got energized after the night nice tea break and I see that the mic is working superbly. Hopefully that one impediment which existed has now been looked after. And thanks a lot Ravi and Ravi okay. for having looked after it. Uh, before we begin this session I have two requests. As I said earlier, please Learning is part of every symposium that we do. It doesn't matter how much you feel. You don't have to reveal your identity. Please, please give your free completed form. And please be kind enough that before the day ends to give the post-evaluation form also. As we collect the pre and the post Form. All of you, especially the youngsters, will get the DVD containing all the LRS and also the certificate of attendance. For the seniors, yes, these things do not matter because you will ask us. But please give us your wise comments. Where are the lacunae? How do we fill them? Because SDGs will continue to be with us for the next 15 years. And it is important that we do the right things to enable the country to move forward. So please help us in this endeavor. The second session in the morning, I am inviting Dr. Vadva, Vice President of National Academy of Medical Sciences, to chair the session. As happens in most symposia, there have been changes, changes in people coming, changes in the timing of the presentations and you will have to sort of bear with that. We have requested Dr. Kurpa to begin the coming session because ultimately, be it under nutrition, be it over nutrition, the key to solving this problem lies in dietary intake, especially energy intake. Dr. Kurpa's presentation will be followed by my presentation on dual nutrition burden. Dr. Mahindale had had serious problems with his flight. Today seems to be a day when we are having nothing but flight related problems every day. So he was unable to make it after coming to the airport. There are things like that these things unfortunately happen we accept it. To the, uh, as soon as we finish these two, we will take a few questions from the audience because Dr. Kurpad will be leaving. I will be there in the afternoon. We can continue our questions in the afternoon as far as my presentation is concerned. But Dr. Kurpad's session questions have to be asked before he leaves. Yeah. So, that is another request. Please focus your thing. Whether it will be from the distant site or from here, Dr. Kutpad's session related questions have to be asked before he leaves for Bangalore. Dr. Vandu. Thank you. I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Anura Kurpad, a very eminent biomedical scientist with specializations in the field of physiology. He completed his MBBS, MD and Diplomat of National Board in 1988 from St. John's Medical College and his PhD from Bangalore University in 1992. After stints as a Welcome Trust postdoctoral fellow at the Rowett Research Institute UK and at the Dunn Clinical Nutrition Centre in Cambridge UK, he returned to St. John's at the Department of Physiology and set up a stable isotope and physiology unit to work on protein and amino acid requirements. During this period, he primarily worked on accurately measuring human amino acid requirements. In these studies, he set up a definitive, accurate, stable isotope balance method to measure amino acid homeostasis in humans. That provided the basis for the 2007 WHO FAO, UNU, Expert Committee. He was the repertoire of that committee 
to revise the protein and amino acid requirements. Professor Kurpat is currently the head of the Department of Physiology at St. John's Medical College. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, London, National Academy of Medical Sciences, and of the International Union of Nutrition Sciences. He has been awarded the prestigious Welcome Trust India Alliance Marg Darshi Fellowship in 2015. He is the chairman of the ICMR Expert Committee on Nutrient Requirements of Indians. Nutrition and Fortification Scientific Panel of the FSSAI and a member of the Technical Board of Nutrition at Niti Aayog. In 2002, he was appointed the Founding Dean of the St. John's Research Institute, a position he stepped down from in 2011. He has written 400 scientific papers and is the co-editor of the Asia-Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition and on the editorial board of the Journal of Nutrition. He has edited the Asian edition of Guyton's textbook of physiology and written several chapters and books in nutrition. And I can recall, when I was a medical student, Guyton's textbook of physiology was my favorite book. Although many people used to read Gainau and others. So welcome, sir. <coughs> So good morning, uh, good, good afternoon almost, and thank you Dr. Prima, thank you to the NFI for inviting me on this extremely important uh, centenary celebration of Dr. Gopalan, a man I hold in deep admiration uh, as uh, we learned nutrition, uh, and more than nutrition, a sense of responsibility to the country and to people everywhere, and I'm deeply uh, grateful to be a part of this celebration. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. It's important for me also to know if Dr. Uh, Bamji, can you hear me? Because you're very important uh, in, as we go along, you realize why I'm, I, I want you to hear what I have to say. <clears throat> so why? Why worry about energy requirements? There are two reasons. One is for individual health and weight and risk for the chronic disease and the other is public health from the viewpoint of either feeding uh, children as you heard in the last talk or worrying about people eating too much. So uh, the first example for individual health I can give you is these classical studies that were done by uh, Jean Mayer uh, from, uh, from Tufts University who then went on, and there was a, a Center of Excellence in Nutrition at Tufts, named after him, who came to Calcutta in the old days and worked and observed uh, the industrial male population at a jute mill. It was called the Ludlow jute mill. And he just looked at body weights, for example, um, and if I can just, is there a pointer somewhere I can use? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. So you can see I'm using the pointer now. The the you have a pointer? Yeah, can we dim these lights? Quality lights, pretty good. Yes. So please look at this. He found that he looked at several workers in this factory, some of whom did very hard work with as porters. Others did heavy and medium work. There were clerks who did almost no work. And of course there were the supervisors who also did almost no work. And these, this group lived on campus, so they didn't even have to cycle to work. Whereas this group actually in those days would walk or cycle to work. And you see that in general in the group of sedentary people, he observed the body weights were going up. Now at the time, and even today, there are people who believe that energy, what you eat, is dependent on what activity you do. So if you work hard, you eat more. And so you think energy intake would go up and it's fairly self-regulated, that as you became more sedentary, you, your body would tell you, or your appetite would go down. You just feel full. No. What he found was this part of the relationship, as you can see, is in the heavy workers, as they work more, they eat more. Their caloric intake went up. But to surprise, we found that there was a dysregulation that occurred 
in the sedentary and light workers that the more sedentary they became, particularly this group here who called stall holders, who sat in a stall all day, not moving, they just sat behind the bench. And it just went up and up till they were eating 3,500 calories for doing no work. And that is a dysregulation. So it's very important to consider setting a standard for how much you need to eat because your body does not tell you that. So this is one reason I'm giving. The second is of course the SDG goals, which we are all here to debate. And of course the goal to have zero hunger. Now, if you were to then evaluate a national population for hunger, you would first have to start with how much they needed. And if they ate less than what they needed, you would consider them to be hungry. And that depends on a notional energy requirement, uh, which we call the RDA. <clears throat> it's also important to understand that once we set these energy requirements, we then look at the gaps, and then we look to see how food subsidies can be put into place to fill those gaps. It's unfortunate that we only consider energy when we consider when food subsidies are put in place and cereals, but that is a peculiarity of India that we do not have the right supply and perhaps even the will to put up anything other than cereals. Now counterintuitively, doing all this has the potential for pushing us down the path of becoming an obese and fat nation. So while we, while we want to reduce hunger, we have to wonder are we dealing with a double-edged sword and creating more problems than we solve. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. The first problem is, and Dr. Prema often calls this the elephant in the room, and that she's absolutely right. How did we set our energy requirements? Are we feeding our people too much? Are you, in your dietary practices, actually looking at a subject and prescribing too much food for them? Think about that. Because over the years that you deal with those patients, you might find they're putting on weight much to your surprise. <clears throat> and then, of course, the High Court in Tamil Nadu, the Madras High Court, just three days ago said, and this is a nice saying, they said, do not give free rice to people. People are becoming lazy. In other words, you feed them too much, it's bad. And that's just three days ago. I wonder what effect it will have on our subsidy systems. But it's important that, and they're saying that actually Tamil Nadu has become a state which imports workers to do hard work from northern states because they're too lazy, eat too much rice. I don't know. There are too many people here from Tamil Nadu who will probably get very upset with me. But I did not say it, it was the, city, the, the high court. Now, Dr. Prema is actually a pioneer in all these things. And she wrote an article in the Indian Journal of Medical Research on poverty and nutrition linkages in which she pointed out how that India was the first country in the world to define poverty as the per capita expenditure of the lowest expenditure class, which was defined by the amount of energy they needed. And that was 2,400 calories per day and 2,100 calories in urban areas. Dr. Bamji, can you see? Yes, okay. Now, Dr. Bamji has often spoken about the Rangarajan Committee. And I think before I get to that, I just want to say that in our country, we are engaged with trying to meet these SDG goals to look at the hungry people in those who live below the poverty line. All right? So get that. The hungry people in the BPL. Now, there are two norms for this. You can use the FAO norm, which is what they call the MDER, the Minimum Dietary Energy Requirement, which the FAO, in all its wisdom, set at 1,800 calories per day. How do they do that? They just, I think, in my opinion, they went too far down a path of being too nice to everybody, and they decided to take the fifth percentile of the BMI distribution, the fifth percentile, that is the really skinny people, and then looked at, for an attained height, you can, if you know the height and you know the BMI, you can calculate the weight. They worked out that weight and therefore the energy requirement for that weight and figured out, based on the fifth percentile, 
of BMI that a person would need 1,800 kilocalories per day. They of course covered and hedged their bets because they also said this would not be sustainable in the long term. <clears throat> 1,800 calories, all right? That, please keep that figure in mind. It's going to be uh, uh, a bit of a, uh, a marker for me, uh, 1,800. But know this, that the FAO thinks 1,800 is not sufficient for sustained life. Now, Ramesh Chand from the Niti Aayog, another member of the Niti Aayog who is involved with agriculture, wrote a very nice paper in 2013 in the Indian Journal of Agricultural Economics. And there, he used the ICMR and NIN's 2010 requirement rather than the FAO requirement. And he tried to say, well, the FAO set that up as a requirement. What if we use what our country defined as a requirement, which was the ICMR 2010? And he found that if you use that one, well, you suddenly found you had a large number of hungry people because you had a higher requirement. 1,800, the FAO requirement was considered too low. Let's take the requirement. Now, here's the big question. How on earth do I figure out the requirement of this room of people, for example? Well, one way is I can weigh all of you, get your average weight, and then get your average physical activity, and then figure out how much each of you needs, and then figure out how many of you are hungry. That's what you do for a nation. And that's what the Rangarajan Committee did in the Planning Commission in 2014, where they took the, the census and figured out the population and created population weights for a number of age groups, you can see there. They took male, female, they took sedentary, moderate, heavy activity, they took non-workers where they couldn't figure out what the person was working as, so they did it for females, and then they got the census and worked out the weights one should put to the energy requirement that was defined by the ICMR in 2010. Am I being clear about this, so it's very clear there is no one requirement because there are too many age groups, too many activities. So give a weighted kind of average. And when they got that weighted average, you look at the bottom, they got 2,155 calories in rural and 2,090 calories in urban, a difference of about 60 calories per day between urban and rural. But remember, this was lower than the 2,400 standard. So this is how you do it. And I think Dr. Rangarajan was an extremely bright man to actually get this way of figuring out how much was the caloric requirement. When he did this, and then, oops, I'm not sure. Well, when he did this, he figured out that something like if you took the below poverty level people in this country, and now what's the poverty level? Another big argument about what people need, but let's say it's about 25% of this country population lives below the poverty level line. Then if you figure out how much they need to eat based on a caloric standard, you will find that about 60 to 70% of that population is at risk of being hungry. And you will use the word undernourishment. That's the word economists like to use. I never figure out what it means, but it's a word they are comfortable with to say that the energy intake does not match the requirement, 60 to 70 percent. Now you work that out backwards and backwards into the whole population, that means that about 16 percent of the Indian population at large is hungry. That is unacceptably high, if you ask me. And I think, you know, you would expect that this should be in the 5 percent range. But to see that it's 15 or 16 percent means there are people who are being left out of the great advances that are being made in this country. So, so far so good. I'm working with the ICMR values, 2010, and then I'm working with what the Rangarajan Committee did to get what the requirement was, and this is across all age groups, all right? Now, I'm going to now turn this on its head. First. How do you get the energy requirement? Because ICMR had a way of doing it. Now, the fundamental issue is this, that in 1985, the FAO, WHO, and the UNU sat together and created a little blue book, which I'm sure all of you read when you were younger. And that blue book was the first step that said, 
you cannot decide the energy requirement of a population by, by looking at what they eat. That is what is done before. So again, in economics terms, it is what we call demand. So you just look at what is the amount people are spending on food, what is the amount they're eating, and you say that's the demand and therefore that's the requirement. That's the wrong way also to do it. The real physiological way is to always base it on the, what is expended. So you have to figure out energy expenditure. And since 1985, by the way, that committee started sitting in 1980. So let's say for the last 30 years almost, it's been how much energy is expended in the population. And based, I just want to tell you, and if you go back to Rangarajan here, can you see this sedentary male, 2320 calories? Well, if you go to the ICMR book, you'll see that man sedentary work has 2320 calories. If he's a little active, you add 400 calories to that. If he's very, very active, you add almost 1,000 calories to that. For women, 1,900 add approximately the same amounts per month. And if you think about it, that's, well, you think it's a meal or two per day extra. <clears throat> and you think about that as well. There was one thing that we did in the ICMR NI 2010 requirements. What you do for children is that you actually figure, and this is very important for schools and midday meals and so on, that I'll figure out what does a child need for a moderately active child who's running around in the game time and, you know, goes back home, runs around outside, outside of school, play hours, an active child. We call that moderate activity and Prema was really very important. I thank you for that, Dr. Prema. I think she said to me, we are doing a disservice to this country if we do not, even for children in the school age, describe what we think should be that that a sedentary child eats, should eat, that child who goes for tuition all the time or is sitting in front of a television, as opposed to what we consider what a healthy, normal, active child should have. So we have actually done this for the ICMR 2010, and we have to thank Dr. Prema for that, because I also first argued with her and then I saw the light, and then we wrote this together. Now, but remember this, that the midday meal requirements are calculated based on a moderately active child, and if you talk to those who purvey midday meals to children, like the ISKCON Foundation and so on, one of their complaints is that about 20% of the rice they give the children is not eaten, it's wasted. And they cannot, are unable to get the government to understand this and to say, put less money into the rice, put that money that you have saved into vegetables. There are too many vested interests in cereals. They just can't get out of it. It is so sad to see. But that's the point, that we need to understand that our children are also becoming obese, and if they're, they're becoming obese because they're being fed too much, and we are translating the food-based recommendations from the moderate activity, and we should be clear. But, and you really ask yourself, what am I going to do? I find this child, I want to be advising this parent, am I going to say, ah oh, yes, of course, your child is in tuition three hours a day, and doesn't play, so they must eat less. That's hardly the advice you want to give. You actually want to say, well, get your child more active. Because they're eating too much, make them spend that energy. There's a conflict here in how you actually decide to deal with children. I'm not going to deal with children because it takes too long. And besides, you heard about children in the last talk, so let's talk about adults. Now, in adults, if I wanted to figure out the energy requirements of this population, I would actually figure out your body weight and then work out some factors into that body weight and then figure out your energy requirements. Or, if I had some money, I could actually measure total energy expenditure. To do the prediction from components, you measure the body weight and the body weight will then tell you the BMR, the basal metabolic rate. And then you take a questionnaire and ask the person, what were you doing yesterday? Or what did you do last week? And can you tell me how many hours you spent walking, running, sitting, blah, blah, blah. And you figure out, you put some energy coefficients to those, you add them all up. One problem. Everyone thinks BMR measurements are the easiest thing in the world. They're probably the most difficult measurement in the world. Because they require a great attention of detail. You have to really have a, a person who is sleeping. You should measure them in the fasting state. 
and you should have woken them. They can't go back to sleep because that's the sleeping metabolic rate. So you have to keep tapping them and wake them up. And then it's got to be a thermoneutral condition. It's all very difficult. And you know, there are many reports where people say, I measured BMR. They've actually measured the resting metabolic rate, which is completely different. Now, the point is that there was a great deal of effort that the FAO put into measuring the BMR in different populations. And they, they collected all these data in before 1985, and they created these age and sex specific equations. And the most famous of them is the Schofield or the FAO WHO equation. Now, the Schofield, there were two Schofields unrelated to each other, and they actually had this database. And a lot of their data came from Italy, where there was a lady there called Anna Ferraluzzi who actually recruited young men from an army camp. If you think about it, you want to get young, healthy men, what's the best place to go? Go to an army recruiting camp, because they'll all land up there. But the problem was in this army recruiting camp, they were highly muscular young recruits, and it's, it's thought that they probably had a higher BMR, because the more active tissue you have, the higher your BMR is. So the Schofield equation was done, FAO accepted it, and by the way, that equation is now accepted even to, to this date, 30 years later. Do you know why? And this is my frustration, because I went to FAO and said, well, I've got problems with this bunch of people, this army recruits, so can I have the database, please? I'd like to remove those subjects and recalculate. They don't have the database. So that we have an equation that FAO WHO UNU uses in which you put your faith. They don't have the original data. And they don't have it because Schofield took it away with him when he left. And we don't know where Schofield is now. We don't know. And I have been telling the FAO, it's high time you repeated all these measurements because I am convinced that you are creating obesity in this world because you are predicting too much energy requirement. So that's what I think. Is that true? <clears throat> well, let's look at a, a biological basis for what I think. Now, if you have someone who's got little fat, and you have someone who's got a lot of fat, and you, you look at how much of fat-free mass each has, it'll be different. There's a 10 kg difference in this example of active tissue. Do you know that it could actually change your BMR by 10%? So you take a ball of fat and measure the BMR of a ball of fat, there will be no BMR. It's in almost inert. You take a ball of muscle or a ball of brain, there will be a lot of activity. So it really depends on how much. And we all know that Indians are a little too fat for anyone's liking. So perhaps we are probably going to have a lower BMR. So that's what I think. That's the biological basis over here. Is this true? Yes. Prakash Shetty, <clears throat> in the old days, for a variety of reasons, mainly to actually argue against Dr. Sukhakne at the FAO, there was another big hypothesis at the time and controversy. But let's not get into that. That was a different thing, and I think Dr. Bhakti will know all about that uh, controversy. Now, he did a lot of experiments using the predicted Schofield equation and measured the BMR. I know he measured because he had these students called Mario Suarez and Sunil Pierce who are both in Australia now, but they actually sweated and struggled to get subjects to sleep the night in the lab, wake them up, do a true BMR measurement, and consistently in urban men, rural men, in women and other men, it was all around 10% lower when they measured it versus the prediction. So what I thought was, yes, it's probably overestimating. There's a biological basis for it, and there's a validity to those to that biological basis in that it is indeed 10% lower. Is there any external validity to this? After all, this is Indian data. Yes, there are studies from around Asia, and you go into the net and look, you will find that everyone is saying that they get about 10 to 15% lower on BMR measured versus predicted. It is high time this was changed. And I just don't know how we do it. But in India, we have taken Prakash Shetty's equation and we use that as a predictor for BMR. 
So I've said about that, that's 10% lower. What about physical activity? Are we getting that wrong as well? After all, how wrong can you get? This is it's a questionnaire. Just go out, ask people, and if they're telling you lies, that's a problem. But if they're not telling you lies, what's the problem? Well, there is a problem. First, I just want to tell you that India, this is a data set that came out in nature, and it was using these apps. They somehow got big data and collected data from every app in the world. And they then were able to figure out different countries. And India was one of the less active countries. If you look at the average daily steps, which should go from 6,000 down to 3,500, India was approximately 4,300 steps per day. And it's men who were stepping more. Females actually were much more inactive. They call this social, they call this activity in inequality. And the higher the inequality, the higher the obesity, and it's more likely to occur in women. Now, we can argue about why that occurs, and whether the opportunities to walk freely exist in this country, that's a different story. But India is inactive. All right? That's where India is. So, there's a large gender gap that I wanted to point out to you. So, what you do is take a history of activities you want to be really accurate. Don't use apps. Multiply each activity duration into its activity expenditure. You call that the physical activity ratio. Sum them up. Divide that by the total number of time you're covering. And that gives you a sum factor that you multiply into the BMR. Quite simple. The problem is, and if you read that INSA uh, proceedings that Dr. Prema revealed today, this, there is a paper in that written by all of us, which really suggests that the PAR is quite different for many of the activities that are reported in FAO UNA. And we should be careful to think that maybe for our population, we need population-specific PRs. And you see the same fault in me again. Am I just telling you my opinion? Or do I have data to back this up? Well, I, there is data. I have some and some others have. But this is the important figure I want to show you, that if you take if you measure PAR in a 70 kg person or a 40 kg person, you'll get different, different values for the same activity. So they spend different amounts of, of energy in that activity. And this is the point. The FAO pushed PAR as a great measurement because they said it was independent of weight. It was independent of age. It was independent of gender. They said, what a wonderful metric this is. It's not that wonderful after all. Because if, if you just take two different weights, you will see that there is a chance of you overestimating the energy requirement if you use a BMR multiple for 70 kg person and apply it to a 40 kg person. Now that sounds and looks very complicated. I, yeah, I think so. But there was this lady called Parvati Ishwaran who was at uh, Avinash Lingam College, a wonderful lady. And she came to me and said, let's do some work on power because she too didn't believe in it. And so I had a student at the time called Rebecca, Rebecca Kurian. And Rebecca's PhD thesis was done at Avinash Lingam. And her whole thesis was, can we measure power of activities in Indians? And more importantly, is it different in different sized bodies? And Rebecca did this in a number of, of people, ironing, walking, she did sweeping, she did washing, oh, she did all sorts of things using this kind of a device. And she found that, well, yes, as the size changes, you get different parts. And these were all published in the British Journal of Nutrition. I'm not sure where they've gone after that, but here's what I want to leave you with. I had two opinions. BMR is overestimated, and I'm telling you there's data to prove that. The second opinion was, I think the power method is not a great method. Because you'll take your history and you'll apply that religiously, but you'll make big mistakes. There's also data for that. All right. So you can take the power into one whole thing and you call it the PAL. It's called physical activity level. That means it's the amount for the whole day. Now, if you look at that, the physical activity level that was set by FAO, WHO, UNU in 2004, that's the latest book, was always a range. They said, we don't know. It's hard to figure out activity. So it's just a, let, let's take a range. And what did we do at ICMR? We didn't have enough data, so we said, no, 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 you need one value. 
because you know all the regulatory agencies in this country want one value, don't give them a range. So we took the middle of that range and that's what's there. That's just a compromise, but that's what we have. So the question you need to ask yourself is, were we overestimating here? Should we have taken the lower bound of this range and been conservative? Well, if you do that, you'll see that the energy requirement of a person based on the ICMR of a woman, 1,900 calories for sedentary, if you just took a new BMR, you'd reduce that to 1,812. If you take a decreased PAL, you will bring it down even further. You take both of them together, from 1,900, you're down to 1,658. Now this is the whole discussion we are having now as we decide the new RBAs that should come out in 2019 and these are the arguments we have to go through to figure out what do we need to do, what, it, what, what do we have. Dr. Prema, how much time do I have? Not much. I'll finish in five minutes. This is the same, same thing done for men from 2320 it comes to 2010. And I just wanted to show you these maps, the blue. Can you see this? This is men, right? You'll see that the light blue is 2,250 calories, and then it goes up to 2,750. And there's no, nowhere in India that the average intake is less than 2,250. And what is the requirement I showed you? It could be much lower. And now you begin to think, gosh, look at this. I've come down to 2010, and what did the FAO say was the minimum dietary requirement? 1,800. I'm getting there. Okay? So, Chand and Germani, as I said, used these values. They used the values that came out of the Rangarajan Committee. And what I have done is just recalculated based on the Rangarajan Committee. And I've changed. I showed this table earlier. This is the Rangarajan Committee. I've just changed the values to sedentary. Okay? From 2320, I brought it down to 2010. For non workers, also, I brought it down. For female sedentary, I brought it down. For female non-workers, I brought it down. And for anyone above 60, I used them as sedentary. So I did not change the entire Rangarajan uh, calculation. Just the sedentary. And if I base it on that, if you come right to the bottom, you'll see what the Rangarajan committee came out in was 2,155 for men. It's now 2,058. So about 100 calories more for men and women. Question, what does that do to hunger. This is the problem. I, these numbers can be used to say, wow, we are conquering hunger. It's not true. It's just an artificial theoretical alteration. But what does happen is that hunger levels go down by 10%. That is something very nice for those in power and not so nice for those who are socially inclined and say, uh, show me the truth behind all these things. So please understand that it's only a work in progress. I did not alter the energy of the heavy activity, moderate activity. I've got to do much more. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to leave you saying, gosh, you know, Anura can actually now fiddle with these data and he'll get hunger levels down to 10% from 16. I won't. But I, I just want to show you that you can play with numbers and create or make things disappear. That, I'll leave it at that. And Dr. Prema will always tell me, be careful with what you wish for. And I, so I'll leave that. But I just want to say that I'm just talking about energy. The quality of that intake is another matter entirely. Let's not go into that. You can look for the validity of whatever I'm saying, and you can make it valid by using measures of total energy expenditure. And the FAO actually did this. It, earlier, this was the energy requirement for babies, was nearly 120 calories. Once they started using double label water, you'll find that they reduced it to 80 calories. A huge difference, which I actually tracked by looking at the tins of these complementary foods that are sold to people. In that, they put these little scoops of how much to feed. And a lot of companies are actually selling this level to calculate the number of scoops, and actually they should have lowered it. But why would they do that? You want to sell more. That's the point. If the same thing for children, you'll see that boys and girls, earlier this was the level it was considered to be the requirement. It was brought down dramatically once we started measuring. And I want to tell you that I've been measuring millennials. Do you know what a millennial is? A millennial is somebody who was born between 1995 
1985 and 95. They're the people who are now entering the workforce. The centennial is someone who was born at the turn of the century. Lots of millennials in this audience, I think. And when we took millennials who said, I'm active, I love my life, I played basketball thrice a week, I'm really I sweat it out. So I gave them double labeled water, and when I gave them double labeled water, that's the level I'm finding. It's about 1,900 calories. People are not as active as they claim to be. And a questionnaire never tells you. By, by a questionnaire, when I did a history, I was getting about 2010 or something. It's lower. We need to figure this out. Well, I just conclude here that energy expenditure is low. Errors exist. Sedentary behavior is just getting worse. Centennials are even worse than millennials. Overweight is doubling and tripling in this country. NCD is exploding. And if we're going to look at the elephant in the room, we really need to change the energy requirements. We have to. We are doing a great disservice to this country if we continue to tell people that this is what you need or we give subsidies based on this is what you need when we got it all wrong. I just want to tell you what's coming. Rebecca the girl who did the physical activity ratios recently did a study along with a group of people in six countries to actually look at the energy content of what is called fast food and full service food. She and her students went into these hotels around St. John's, many hotels, many restaurants, and ordered food. And then quietly packaged the whole thing, took it back to the lab, weighed it, blenderized it, put it into a bomb calorimeter and measure the true energy content. All right? So this is it. And in the US, for example, there were many more. But it was always thought India eats less. Okay? Guess what? The average for full service was 1,400 calories per meal. Fast food, 1,200. Look at the amount of food. It's about a kilo of food that people eat per meal. I think, you know, we really need to think about what we do. And then she's actually given all these. Here, I just wanted to show you. This is shocking. Go and have a meal in a restaurant with roti, paneer, vegetable sabzi, dal, little flavored rice, curd rice, papad, salad, pickle. 1,800 calories. That's your entire requirement in a day. And then you think, gosh, you know, Chinese food is so nice. It's light. Go and have a chicken fried rice with chicken tuna. 2,234 calories. Anything fried, rice particularly, rice loves oil. Take a biryani, take a pulao, take fried rice. <laughs> it's a bomb. Okay? And I just want to show you that these are the pictures of that food. And uh, I was uh, talking to Dr. Shashikan, <laughs> and we were thinking that, you know, the, the health and nutrition slogan now is Aad Se Thoda Kam. What do you think? Dr. Shashikaran, what do you think it should be? Aadha Kao. or Faida Pao. I think that's very important. When you go out, eat half a dosa. By the way, a masal dosa, you think was 400 calories? 500? It's 1,050 calories. And you ask them to make it crisp for you, you're going to get more. Okay, so I think we are just overeating in this country. The amount of energy in our going out. And if you look at the spending habits of millennials and centennials, there's several reports on this, you will find that they're spending a significant amount of their money on eating out. There is a huge problem going on and we are not we are not seeing it happen. And by the way, were you eating out just now? <laughs> How many calories do you think that was? So there's the handsome young model holding that. He promised that he'll post me an after picture because we think that's about a thousand calories in his hand. But we'll have to see. But I would say just eat half. Eat less. Hard say ziyada kam. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Yes. yes, please do. Shout I can hear you. Please provide the mic. Physical 
I think protein does have satiating effects. Yeah. Protein does have satiating effects. Uh, I'm not sure whether carbohydrates have or not, but I'll tell you one thing. Our stomach is a receptive bag. If the more you stuff into that stomach, the more it will receptively relax. And a stretched stomach secretes ghrelin, which is an appetite generating hormone. That is why bariatric surgery chooses to try and reduce the amount of stomach. And you need to shrink your stomach. Those of us who eat so much, I mean, you know, 800 grams of food, I calculated, is 5% of your body weight. And here's the elephant in the room they were talking about. An elephant eats 5% of its body weight per day. So are we. There's something wrong with what we're doing. I think we're stretching our stomachs too much. Yeah. Please, do you need the mic? Getting nicer by your, uh, you know, seeing it beyond, and I think that's very few people do this research exercise. But I want to flag two things: the difference between predictive and estimated being 10 percent, uh, between 8 to 9 percent actually, is something that was very evident, hmm. was known. And I think the uh, social equation or whatever predictive equations were there in the 1985 document, it was more for public use later. Uh, and not uh, uh, knowing that this is going to be a slightly higher value. The second thing is I have always, you know, I always see this uh, commission report of 2400 and 2100 of which I was passing, the NCI at that time, uh, the planning commission. And we worked on this uh, knowing pretty well that um, this is a lower estimate of the requirement. Dr. Swaminathan continues to say why nutritionists recommend 2400 calories you can well do with 1800 calories. And this produces undue burden on production, uh, food production. It does. And the 2400, those who consume this kind of diet, are known to be overweight in weight. This was a very correct observation. Even our dietitians just practice 1600 to 1800 calorie diet under specific regime. So nobody recommends 2400. Uh, however, the whole exercise of the commission at that time had got nothing to do with requirements, had nothing to do with hunger, or maybe something to do with hunger, but to define actually the BPN and minimum wage. So if it was not 2400 calories, the minimum wages would then drastically fall, leading to general poverty in the country. And that was the purpose, and not to actually fix the energy requirements. It was known that this value was going to be more. Even in uh, the rural sector, why it was here 21, uh, what, I mean, there was less uh, labor saving devices at that time than now. So actually, with lack of uh, employment, thus in slums and in rural areas, there is huge reduction in energy expenditure. So the, one of the reasons that the weight gain has become very evident is Actually, unemployment among youth and productive age groups, and they do not spend the amount of energy they should be spending, <coughs> including children who do not get space. Now, the school earlier the school regulation required a certain sports area and a one-hour sports area, and then the games were specified, you know, basketball and co co and whatever. Now, uh, the schools are multi-story, and they do not have a sports area and they do not make it as a mandatory period also. Something which I think I spend on with Canadian College Collaboration is trying to work on number of steps to school and activity scores to be able to promote the activity. But to the number of children who are present in the country now, the play area is not there, negligible. So not only will we have problem of food not being available, will also be the activity and exploratory activity area which is going to affect cognition, it's going yeah. to affect uh, expenditure. Yeah. So these are important trends which are very evident. The only thing is, it's not always that when one is one is talking about policies, who we work, this is low. You know. So somewhere it had to be. 
uh, on the plate, I, uh, that is for that page 400 calories mm -hmm. more. So I have, you know, continued to keep that for many years. And that's not a requirement thing, going very well. But the audio book should be truly representative of expenditure data. Mm -hmm. So there is one reference point among people who educate themselves in the field of nutrition that they are sensitive to these fine rules. That is yeah, yeah. So can I just be really clear, and I, I, I have no intent of saying those are requirements. So the point is that a poverty line is drawn based on being able to spend a certain amount of say a dollar and twenty-five cents. It's by no means a requirement. It's just a line one draws in the sand. So the whole business of saying two thousand four hundred, two thousand two hundred blah, that is more from the viewpoint of trying to look at the SDG goals and look at hunger, it's not a requirement. Where I'm coming from is public health, which is this, but there's a private health and that, and I want you to look at certain apps on the market today, they're called Healthy Find Me or, I mean, there are all sorts of apps. All they ask you is give your weight and then give your activity and they figure out your energy and many young millennials use these things. And my worry is that the equations they're using are different so they're, they're basically going into, you, you enter the food you eat, it tells you and tells you you're eating too much, but they're measuring too much of a requirement. And apps are going to be there. And I, I just feel that we really, in India, we need to write these things properly so that these guys who are in the software industry at least, they are influencing the world a lot and they should know it. Many years ago, one of our students in Hinnai did a study. He gave the rats a chemistry of choice of meal, a five carbohydrate, five protein, five fat. Most of the rats actually offered five carbohydrate. Correlated it with the raw medical, oxidative phosphorylation. So there seems to be a relationship between the amount of oxidative phosphorylation. What a good question. I, I, I'll go and check it out. I don't know. But you're saying that uh, muscle and liver of sauce could be important in altering choices for food. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll check. But I do know that even in these rats given these diets, there's a male-female effect. The females put on more weight. So I, I don't know. <laughs> don't eat so much. Shall I come back? No, oh. you take your back. Oh. May I now request? Haan, <laughs> haan. Please, please, aage jayana. So that they can take the good photograph. Okay. And Dr. Gopalan will be... Okay. I will take my next few years. Light on. 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 Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>